have some patients that are just more difficult, and I'm talking personality. We did have a breakup, right? And so that's always difficult when you have to kind of <laughs> break up or fire a client. That's not always an easy situation to handle. Don't so. be a Karen. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back for another exciting episode of Beauty and the Brain. We are the podcast where we discuss everything aesthetics. I'm your co-host, Dr. Chris Crowley. And I'm Jerry Drinkard, a family nurse practitioner. Today we're going to be diving into some cool stuff and talking about our challenging patients we see in the clinic. And it's a whole array. It's not necessarily what you think when we talk about bad patients. So pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, we're going to talk about difficult patients and even a little bit of the difficulties we've had, kind of some challenges with treating ourselves. So I think when uh, everyone thinks about difficult patients, we really think about a challenge or a fight or a confrontation. And we're not necessarily, uh, you know, only talking about that. Yeah, we can talk about how we handle some of those situations, but we really don't have a lot of that, to be perfectly honest. But when we talk about difficult patients, we talk about ones who have a challenging treatment plan or something that they really uh, want treated in the med spa setting or with injectables, it's not, maybe they're not the ideal candidate for that, but they won't uh, really consider a surgical option. So we're going to kind of delve into all of those things and uh, talk about when is surgery your best option? When do you need to uh, consider maybe not going down the uh, injectable pathway? So it's an exciting show, um, a, a topic that we both are uh, passionate about and love to talk about and teach about. So, um, you know, I think we'll just start with the, one of the questions that we get most common from patients. And uh, this wasn't submitted through our Facebook group for the podcast, but uh, it, it was submitted online and we do have this ask all the time in the practice. And the patients, when we ask them what brings them to see us or why are they there, they wanna know, what do you think I need? <laughs> you knew it before I said it. So tell me how you handle that. I think I've said in every episode that the consultation is one of the most important component of our treatment for patients. And that's exactly where this all starts is with the consultation. And so the way that my consultation process starts is very similar to yours and the other um, providers in our clinic is I usually hand them a mirror and say, you know, what bothers you? What brings you here? And they'll take a look and they'll, they may point to something, but then they, they always say, what do you think I need? And so, um, you know, my opinion of that may be much different than theirs because usually they come for something very specific. It may be a one smoker's line or, you know, a tiny crow's feet, or they may have lots of lines and wrinkles that draw my attention and they may have like one brown spot above their eye that bothers them. So I think it's important to not jump the gun and give them like my opinion until we find out what really brings them into the clinic. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important things, and uh, we, we talk about this a lot. A lot of patients, if they're just venturing into aesthetics or they're uh, coming in just for their first time, they might not even realize all the options that are out there available for treatment, or they haven't really looked at their, their face enough to even know some of the things that we may be assessing as an injector. So I agree with you. Um, we both start off the same way. Give them a mirror and say, tell me what bothers you the most, or if this was a magic mirror, what would you do uh, You know, to change? And obviously, we're there as the expert and we can give them some guidance on our opinions, but we uh, need to make sure that we're addressing their concerns first and then kind of coming up with a plan and educating them on the things that we're looking at and we're seeing that may need changing over time. Right. You know, one of the things that I don't want the consult to be is a negative experience for the patient because regardless, all of the patients have some very positive attributes or very positive features. And so that's one of my questions. And I, it took me a while to, to start this, but one of the things that I ask patients now is, um, what's one of your favorite things about, your, about yourself? And so it kind of sets the tone for for a positive experience on our on our consult. And then you know once we identify that that patient does have have some positive thoughts about their self, one it kind of gets out of the way you know is the patient suffering from some, from some body dysmorphic disorder. But also it also um, kind of lays the groundwork that you've got some really good things going on. Let's check out what what brought you here. And so that's that's how just kind of how I start. Yeah, I kind of start similar, and I talk about things that we can do right away to address those concerns immediately, and then things that are going to be more long term. So, if it's something that we can, you know, provide a quick fix or do something that day, I like to try to address it um, that 
during that initial visit. But uh, a lot of things we do are more comprehensive and it takes a little bit of time to kind of build a plan and make sure that they're following that. On that topic, as we're building a plan, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges we face. And I think that, um, you know, kind of what I'm wanting to talk about here is the compliance issues. So the pre and post procedure compliance and, you know, patients who are interested in only a quick fix and they're, they're not really interested in the most long term. Do you see that often? And how do you deal with that and, and setting expectations? Yeah, I think um, I think it's our job as as providers to to help that patient determine what realistic expectations because I don't think that they often know. Social media paints a very fair p picture for patients and so I think that that can the um, realistic expectations can be blurred based on social media results and so we all have before and afters and so um, you know I, I'm not not knocking that but I certainly think that it's important to guide that patient into what can be realistically achieved in the setting that they're in because it may not be an aesthetic setting problem for a spa, you know? And so that's where, where we come in. Like we have to guide them on this journey. Yeah, I think that comes in, uh, you know, to, to knowing the products you have or the tools you have in your toolbox as an injector or provider and being able to match that to that patient's uh, problems and, and letting them know, yes, we have something here, we can address this or no, we don't uh, have that. And let me tell you where you can go, whether it's surgery or another med spa, or if they have a device or a procedure that you don't offer that may be best for that patient. Also, we have to really be clear about what the patient needs to do prior to the procedure. So we focus a lot on the procedure, but I try to make sure that, that we set up a, a plan where the patient understands they can contribute to their results by what they do before the procedure. Are there any pre-treatments that you commonly offer? One of the most common treatments that we offer at, um, at our practice now is the neogen plasma. And just taking that that treatment for um, using it for as an, and as, as an example, I think it's really important to condition the skin prior to. And so, you know, with patients that have um, if they have had too much sun exposure, if they're extremely dry, they're obviously not going to have as good a patient outcome as a patient that has a well prepped skin. So we may put them on, you know, three weeks of a hydroquinone. We may bring them in for two to three weeks of um, IV therapy if they're extremely dehydrated or, you know, so we do things to prep the patient's skin. And if, if they're invested in that pretreatment, then they're going to take care of their self afterwards as well. So I think the patient has to have some skin in the game going into it. And that sets them up for one for the best outcome and for a happy patient. And that's been what's grown skin and tonic to the point that it is now is that, you know, uh, word of mouth. We do other avenues of advertising, but I think happy patients is one of the best advertisements that you can do. Yeah, and that, that kind of brings us to the next uh, topic. So if we're trying to, you know, make sure that we have happy patients and that we're building a rapport with them and um, really kind of forming this relationship, we're not just trying to get them in in our practice for, for one visit and, uh, you know, collect the money, whatever we can off that procedure and that we're done with them. We're really looking to build a relationship with them where we're working together over time. And so part of that is, is going to be uh, really communicating thoroughly with that patient, everything that we plan on doing and, um, you know, what we're going to do over time. So with that being said, as much as we try to set expectations and uh, be realistic with what we can do, when we have dissatisfaction, um, how do you deal with it? First, I, I look at the, did I do my job? Like, one, did I provide the outcome for the patient that was expected? Did I set that patient up prior to having the treatment to have a realistic expectation? And so I think my, my first evaluation is on myself as a practitioner. And if you don't have the ability to recognize fault in yourself, then you're certainly starting at a wrong place in this, in this industry. And so that's the, my first step is, did I do everything that I said I was gonna do? Did I have this patient set up for optimal outcomes? And then I look and I see, did something go array during the treatment? Did, for instance, if, you know, if it's a, something as simple as a spot brow, that's an easy correction. Or if it's something as simple as some asymmetry that occurred after 
um, a lip filler. And so, you know, some of these complications can be much more drastic than that. But recognizing our own fault to identifying the problem, why did the problem occur? And the final thing is what can we do to correct it and move forward? And so have you had any recent or any that stand out in your mind as far as complications or unsatisfactory outcomes? Yeah, I think uh, you know any of us in uh, the aesthetic uh, industry, we're going to have patients who are dissatisfied from time to time, and I think the key to that is how do you handle that uh, complication or that dissatisfaction. I couldn't agree with you more. And again, we've had these conversations over the years. Many times when we look back on those patients, what we realize is that we failed to do our job of setting realistic expectations from the beginning. So we either overpromise and underdeliver. We um, miss. Uh, characterize or misjudge the severity of the problem from the beginning and need more treatments than we originally anticipated. And so I'm also very uh, reflective on what did that consult look like? What did I tell the patient? What was my assessment? And I'm very honest about that. So if it's not something that I intended and it happened uh, anyway, I tell the patient, right, this is not what I intended. I think that that what we've heard from other practices and what we still, you know, hear when we're correcting mistakes is the patient feels that a provider tried to convince them why it was okay. And they're looking in the mirror every day at their face and they're seeing this problem and something about the result is bothering them. They're not happy with it. And the provider is trying to convince them why they are being unrealistic, why they're uh, you know, wrong about their assessment. And then, you know, I look at it and it's like, clearly we need to be on the same page. What did I do wrong here? This is not expected. Or if it is the, the circumstance where it is something that is, you know, unrealistic, I bring it back up and I say, hey, we discussed this beforehand. We, you know, had this conversation. Let's use uh, necks, for instance. Everybody hates a turkey neck. I hate my turkey neck. Let's look at it here. And I'm constantly wanting something done to that, right? Um, and, and we've done a, a million different treatments on that. And uh, the same with yours. And you ended up going a surgical route and having some correction done. But if we have a patient that comes into that situation, you know, I have to look at it and say, hey, we talked about this from the beginning. We told you that here are the things we could offer, but that's not going to be the same result as perhaps a surgical approach. And they opted not to do it. So I think you have to be self-reflective. Uh, look at what you may have went uh, did wrong to start with, but also recognize that there are going to be sometimes you do everything right and patients are still dissatisfied. And sometimes patients just don't respond like we think they would. Um, you know, I've, I've had a tattoo removal. Let's use that just as a simple example. But, you know, you have a patient with a easy to remove black and white tattoo that comes in and you think you can get it off in four treatments or five treatments and four or five treatments and they look like they've only had one. And so, you know, some patients just don't, they absolutely don't respond. And so I think that's where communication with our patient, consent with our patients, um, because all of our consent forms do talk about that, about the outcomes. It's not just, consents aren't just about the complications that could occur. It's also about realistic outcomes and these are aesthetic treatments. So I think um, those outcomes don't always, they're not always as predictable as we'd like for to be. And certainly, um, you know, you have some patients that are just more difficult and I'm talking personality. So you have some patients and it doesn't matter how good the outcome is, they're not going to be satisfied. And those are the patients um, that we try to eliminate during our consultation process. And hopefully patients will eliminate us during the consultation process as well. I think it's an interview, you know. And so if they don't think we can achieve their goals, then this is a good time for us to cut ties and they can go down the street. And the same with us. If it's something that we identify that personality is not a good fit with us at the clinic, I think that's an easy time to, like, let's stop this before it goes down a road that neither of us want to venture down. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And I think it's uh, easy or easier for us to say that now. So at this point in our career, and you know, we've been doing this now um, right at 15 uh, years. And, and so we have a, a large uh, client base. And so we are a little bit more selective. We do turn people away. We do uh, say no to treatments that they want if we don't think it's indicated. But I think that's a little bit harder for some of the newer practices and newer injectors because they really are trying to build their clientele. They're trying to keep their doors open. And so it's hard to say no. But, um, you know, I look back on it and when I look at the, you know, let's just say the last year, I've, on, I've you know, only had 
two really challenging patients that I could think of that we really just didn't um, see eye to eye on the treatment, the results, the plan. And they were patients that were kind of identified early on that probably was not a good match for our practice. And we would have all been better off to say right from the beginning, we're probably not the practice for you. There are other places that maybe you would just mesh with the personality better, the results better, um, the skill set of that other injector better. Yet, you know, I opted to treat them anyway, and then we dealt with that, you know, kind of for months. And we really want to make our patients uh, happy and satisfied. So we do everything possible, even when we kind of misjudge that to start with. We continue trying to get them the results they want. So uh, did you have a breakup? Yes, we did have a breakup, right? And so that's always difficult when you have to kind of <laughs> break up or fire a client. That's not always an easy uh, situation to handle. You've got to give them some alternatives. Where can they go? Uh, many times they may be unhappy with you for firing them, but honestly, if I can't, if I've done the best of my ability and it's not getting the results that they want, I also don't want them to continue trying to, to spend money for something that clearly we're not moving towards a goal. So sometimes as a provider, you have to be the one to say, look, we're just not the practice for you. And, and so, yes, we've had to do that. Fortunately, it's very, um, very rare. I think uh, probably in the whole time we've been in practice, the only there's only twice ever that we've had to actually dismiss or fire a patient that we wouldn't work with any longer. We've had, you know, some others where we've had to like come up with some different treatment plans and be creative, but only two that we've had to say, we won't see you well, anymore. We've also had some that my personality didn't mesh with theirs that uh, sent to you mm -hmm. and you've had the same situation. And so I think we're very fortunate that we have, we have each other and we also have Allie um, in the practice and that, makes it really easy because between the three of us, we all have three have different different personalities, but between the three of us, there's usually somebody there that um, that they can mesh with or bond with. But, um, you know, it, I think it's it comes a point when none of us are able to meet their needs and that's when that surgical referral um, comes in. And that's just a conversation that you really have to handle pretty delicately with some patients because they may not realize it. You know, I mean, you and I, we've been in it and I can't tell you how much money we poured into my neck because we have, we have all the toys at the clinic. We've done threads and Cabela and, you know, um, how much neurotoxin, how many threads, how, what all have we done, all therapy to my neck versus finally taking that leap and doing a surgical intervention. And so, um, you know, it came for me, it was an easy, easy decision, but it may not be so easy for someone else, you know, because they do look at us as somebody that can take care of these problems. So how would you handle it with a patient that wasn't quite ready for that? Would you continue to treat or? Um, well, I think that's something that you have to decide as a provider and the patient together, um, you know, as a team. And I think that's easier to do when you've had that patient for a while, when you've established and you've built that rapport and the patient understands it's not just you trying to make money. And so when they understand that we truly care about their outcome and that we really want the best for them, and sometimes that means going somewhere else, sometimes that means surgery, I think they handle that much better. And I think it's, uh, although those conversations uh, can be difficult, I think they're important to have. And it's, it's sometimes about cost and it's other times about downtime and time out of their schedule. And so, you know, I'll use, um, you know, uh, PDO thread lifting as an example. So, you know, that um, I, I love PDO thread lifts and we have really great results with that. And um, I, I do the most of the lifting threads in our practice. You do a lot of the collagen stimulating ones and so do, uh, so does Allie. So we all do them in some manner, but um, it's something that I do, do fairly often. However, I have to make sure that I identify the correct patient for that type of therapy because everyone comes in and immediately they're gonna pull on their face really uh, sharply and say, I want it lifted like this. And they show me that example. And, you know, realistically, depending on their tissue quality and how, you know, the weight of that tissue, I may not be able to accomplish that with these thread lifts. And I need to have that conversation and say, this is a temporary repositioning of the tissue. You may get some lifting of the skin as a result of that. We can do other things, but it's not the same as surgery. It's not gonna actually remove excess skin. And you can spend a lot of money on these dissolvable threads that's gonna give you a temporary result. And they may tell me, you know what, that's okay. 
I've got a, a family reunion in two weeks or, uh, you know, I'm going to a big graduation event or a wedding and I don't have time to recover from surgery and I want to do what I can. And then that's okay because I'm going to make that decision in combination with them. So I've been honest, upfront, realistic, and we make that plan together versus if they tell me I'm in no time frame, I really just want to, this to be better over time. And I appreciate your honesty that this is a temporary solution. And then I have some surgeons that, that we refer to, and depending on what area or what part of the country you're in, you need to find people in your local area if you're an injector that you can trust and put your patients in their hands. So be honest with the patients and be able to send them out and say, at least go hear their opinion, hear what they have to say, um, because sometimes they can spend a lot of money on injectables and, and threads and things that we're doing in the med spa setting when we actually know that the, the most uh, effective way for them to get their result is gonna be surgery. For the most part, the patients that we have, it's a long-term relationship with them. And what we've seen from ours are, is that they do appreciate it. I think they appreciate the honesty. And I think the surgeons that we work with are really good about sending them back for things that we can manage in the, in the clinic setting. I can't think of a situation where I had a patient that was resistant to the suggestion. They may not have proceeded with the surgery, but I would say most of them have probably gone at least for a consult and that way they do know they know their options you know i think threads is a great example of um how a patient can be dissatisfied just because of some of the the expectations that may be placed on you as a practitioner or me as a, a practitioner for um based on the social media results you know um because everybody has to keep in mind, even some of these before and afters have filters on them. And um, we were just, I was watching a, a webinar yesterday and it was talking about even though um, you combine treatments and when he was talking about combined treatments, he was talking about biostimulants and you still needed HA fillers. You had, you know, a, a surgical facelift and you still needed your neuromodulators. And so there's not a, a single treatment that's going to take care of all of these things. But I think when you get a patient and they start doing these combination therapies, realize that you have their best interests at heart. Um, and a lot of times, and especially you are so conscious about budgets. I think that's one of the things like Chris, for anybody that doesn't know, Chris would give 100% of this stuff away and would not charge anybody anything. So we took him out of this, out of the loop. He doesn't have access to check any patients out or we'd be broke. But, um, but I do think that patients also appreciate our opinions, you know, and when it's, when it's time and we've done our, our due, then like we send them to somebody that we think will take care of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when I grew up and when I first went into to medicine and this uh, field, you know, we didn't didn't have lots of uh, extra money growing up. And so I'm very um, aware of patients' budgets, and it's not my job to determine what they can spend on these elective procedures. I fully understand that. But there's something in my mind about these prices that, um, you know, I feel bad telling them. I think in medicine in general, we're not used to pricing our services, that somebody else handles the billing, they handle all that. So yeah, I do have difficulty with that. And so I'm very aware of that. And so in my mind, that's always part of the discussion that you have with your patients. One is, can you safely do it? Two is, are the results gonna be, uh, you know, what they want? Are you gonna meet it? And then three, what is their budget? Because really, you know, that we do have to take that in consideration when we're making a plan. So, um, you know, I just want to leave with some, uh, you know, I guess key points uh, or, or takeaways from this uh, for injectors and for patients. Um, and, you know, you don't have to treat every patient. And I think as injectors, we have a lot of pressure not to say no. But I think realizing... Especially when you're starting. Yeah, especially when you're starting. But I think it's just as important to know when to say no as it is to go ahead and inject that, you know, neurotoxin or filler or whatever it is that you're gonna treat the patient with that day. And so getting the confidence to, to know your skill set and what you can safely offer is gonna be key for the injectors. For the patients out there, realize that not everything can be fixed with an injection. And so- Don't be a Karen. <laughs> you know I'm gonna have. <laughs> palpitations here with Jerry to say things like that. Some of our favorite patients are named Karen. They and, are. And they do not act like 
the, the Karen that he is uh, uh, referring to. But anyway, as a patient, be sure that you're realistic. Ask your injector these questions. Understand when they guide you away from a procedure, it's probably for your best interest. It's not because um, they're not wanting to treat you, but that they need to, to be realistic with you as a patient and that not everything that we can do in a med spa is something that's going to give you the result. And not every patient is the same, right? So when they come in, we need to make sure that, that we assess that patient individually and come up with a treatment plan that's appropriate for them. Thank you again for tuning in this week to Beauty and the Brain. We look forward to seeing you next week. See you soon. Thank you.